Of all the events that can impact human lives, explosions are easily among the most devastating and the most destructive. While there have been multiple instances in the history of accidents and incidents where various substances have resulted in widespread devastation, they have historically happened with a lot more deliberate intent. It seems that since the advent of gunpowder and all the way through the development of TNT, high explosive weapons, and the development of nuclear bombs, the ability of a blast to wreak havoc over a widespread area has been harnessed by people probably not really in our best interest. And a lot of the time, it has been, again, used against fellow human beings because <laughs> for some reason we're really warlike. However, while accidents with dynamite or high explosives are devastating and the deliberate bombing of others is equally damaging, there is a third scenario that could well be argued is somehow a lot more terrifying. One that defies explanation. So today, we're headed to Siberia and Russia to look into what became known as the Tunguska event and try to figure out what exactly or who caused it. That's right, it could all be a cover. The year is 1908, and it has been since seemingly time immemorial, Tunguska is a barely inhabited and frigid portion of Siberia. Part of modern day Russia, even in a country that is famous for its cold climate and snow, Siberia has always been arguably most framed by how remote it is. In fact, it's probably why Russia is as big as it is, because nobody actually wants to go live there. Well, people live there, uh, but the point is, is that it's really easy to claim land when nobody wants that land. Spanning over an enormous expanse of seemingly nothingness, the distant location and how far it is from much of civilization made it perfect as a location for not only some of like the gulags or work camps, but even the more feared and brutal prisons like the Black Dolphin. While this is still the case today, in the early 1900s, there were even fewer reasons than ever for like any human to try to exist there. The lack of natural resources and the sheer distance that people would have to travel to begin to reach society made it a hard and unrelenting place that seemed to resist human inhabitancy by its very nature. And all of this was exactly why at 7 in the morning on June 30th, and it was still snowing, actually I don't know, it could have been warm, when the peace above this frigid landscape was shattered. It was even more surprising because, uh, well, people weren't really sure why. Those living in the hillside hundreds of miles away reported that the sky lit up with an unearthly glow, the endless dark suddenly illuminated by an unknown source. The strange light was followed shortly thereafter by one of the most extreme explosions that have ever been recorded. It was seen, heard, and measured by instrumentation as far away as several thousand kilometers, which is several thousand miles. Basically, uh, they probably heard it in the US. And just as suddenly as it appeared, it was done. Aside from the various accounts and measurements taken, it was almost as soon as it had begun, it was just poof, over. But those that ventured towards the area where the blast had begun were sure to find the destruction far beyond what any of them had expected. The energy blast was so large that seismic recording equipment in many different countries picked it up as an earthquake. It was visible from Northern Ireland, which is around 3,417 miles or about 5,500 kilometers, plus from the area and reports from as far as the stated that despite it being a moonless night, there was enough of what they described as a nocturnal glow that they could see fairly well despite, you know, it being night. Some even captured evidence of this glow and documented it. Not just civilians and casual observers, but various scientists and researchers. People that you would expect to be able to distinguish between something natural and expected and whatever happened that day. While it was hard to pin down an exact epicenter for the initial event, those that eventually ventured into the area were soon to see that, for the most part, where the main source of the blast occurred didn't really matter a huge amount. They began to encounter trees that had been leveled by the explosion, and not just one or two. There were entire forests that were completely flattened. In fact, there were trees that had been knocked over that stretched over an area calculated to roughly be about 800 square miles, an area greater than the land mass of the Mauritius. It would be estimated that up to roughly 80 million trees were knocked down by the force of whatever the Tunguska event was, and even in the modern day, there are still many of them that can be seen lying flat, still in the exact same position that they were left in more than 100 years ago. A mineralogist who was sighted around 40 miles away from the explosion that morning gave his account. The sky split in two and fire appeared high and wide over the forest. The entire northern side was covered in fire. A tribe that occasionally inhabited the region were known as the Shan Yagir. One of their members gave an account where he and his brother were inside of their hut on the fateful time of the event. The first thing that we noticed was the noise, that they compared to a whistling wind or the sound of many birds flying overhead. When the blast occurred, they were thrown out of bed and could hear the trees falling all around them before the hut itself was demolished. When he looked up, this is how he described it. Then I saw wonder. Trees were falling and branches were on fire. It became mighty bright as if there was a second sun. 
When these reports were all disseminated and boiled down, researchers have come up with just over 40 reports of what they believe came from people that were closer than 130 kilometers from the event as it occurred. Based on the damage caused by the area effect, there have been various calculations made since then to try to estimate the amount of energy actually just generated by the event. Most agree on a force of 3 to 5 megatons. However, some have calculated as high as between 10 and 20. Megaton is a unit used to measure energy and is equivalent to what 1 million tons of TNT would generate. The bomb dropped on Hiroshima in Japan was equivalent to only about 15 kilotons. And we are using the word only very cautiously here because there is no denying that the death and devastation that bomb caused was brutal by any measure. Its TNT equivalent would have been around 15,000 tons. The bomb dropped on Nagasaki was around 21 kilotons or 21 tons of TNT. The damage that these two explosions caused has been documented all the world over and led fairly directly to Japan's decision to surrender. By comparison, the Tunguska event was somewhere between 3 and 5 megatons. That's 3 to 5 million tons of TNT equivalent, by more conservative estimates. An instantaneous blast of energy that almost defies comprehension. While it may not sound like a strange thing to say, it is actually unknown if there was any loss of human life due to the Tunguska event. The remote region where it occurred and the sheer distance that that many of these people live from one another would be classed as a civilization or could be classed as a civilization makes it difficult to calculate not because there are so many apparent deaths but quite the opposite in fact the reality is is that there were no accurate records of who was living within the massive blast zone many of the people that lived even within a hundred miles of the explosion were cut off from the rest of the world they were almost entirely self-sufficient and had little to do with anyone else for this reason the official death count is still thought to be zero although there are local reports that survive from the time that hint as many of like three people losing their lives, it should be noted that this is not based off any bodies that were found, but more on a rumor that people's belief or memory that there were at least some people in the area that either lived in the blast zone or had the potential to be around there when the incident occurred. The three unnamed victims of the event have their deaths recorded as being from an impact with a tree that led to infection, shock, or causes unknown. Without reliable sources though, it's hard to confirm or deny this. Part of this is based on similar, yet much less forceful, events such as an airburst over, and I'm gonna try this, <laughs> Chelyabinsk, probably not how you pronounce it, in 2013 that resulted in a multitude of injuries from the pressure wave associated with the event. What is certain is that a great number of wildlife and reindeer were actually taken out by this event. The number is suspected to be extremely high as they were prevalent across the entire region with many substantial herds known to be active at that time. Estimates put the number that have died anywhere from a hundred to over a thousand. Another group of people, the Avinki tribe, were known to frequent this area as well. They were hunters that were familiar with the area and would later help to guide some of the later expeditions to try and find the impact zone. Evinks, while they still survive to this day, do so in relatively small numbers with less than 40,000 members counted in Russia. Traditionally, they would live in the temporary accommodations while out hunting or herding reindeer, known as chum, which somewhat resembles a teepee. Due to the nomadic nature of these peoples, it's hard to confirm or deny the reports that anyone lost their lives in the immediate aftermath. The number of deaths and injuries notwithstanding, the sheer destruction that the event brought with it led to everyone desperately searching for an explanation because I mean, not really a great time for this to happen. Multiple eyewitnesses presented their versions of the events to those investigating the source and the cause. At the time in 1908, there were still no conventional modern weapons that would have been able to cause such carnage, which is probably a good thing. But the key there was that there were no known weapons that existed. The military were already familiar with high explosives and the use of them to better maim and kill enemies. And if there were some new forms of like devastating explosives being fine-tuned and honed by an army somewhere, could you really think of a better place to test it? After all, if you were going down the route of creating a probably unknown size of explosion, logic would tell you the very best place to do it would be as far away from people as was physically possible. To that effect, you could argue that there were a few places better suited than Siberia and particularly this region. However, calculations have shown that the force of whatever the Tunguska event was or was caused by had the force that surpassed the nuclear weapons dropped on Japan at the end of World War II by around 200 times. One theory was that it could have been caused by a black hole somehow. That's right, that the very fabric of space and time had been wrenched open and the resulting chaos was the cause of this devastation left behind in its wake. And as to be expected, there is no evidence or justification given for this or even an explanation of how
how this would have happened. Why it happened there, or what would stop it from happening either again or repeatedly has never really been discussed. Similarly, another wild theory proposed was that it was antimatter, in a form that the proposer does not really elaborate on, collided with the ordinary matter of our planet and generated an absurd amount of energy as it disappeared from existence in a split second. The result of this, through mechanisms that are really never explained, was the destruction that is now known as the Tunguska event. Unbelievably, for once in what feels like forever, not a single person suggested that aliens were somehow responsible. Ah, just kidding, they totally did. Because no matter what the situation, no matter the location, no matter if it was aliens or not, seemingly regardless of time frame or world picture at the time, there is always at least one theory that points to the skies. Some believe that a strange light, or the strange light, the explosion, and the felled trees could only mean one thing a visit or crash landing by an extraterrestrial brethren. One of the ideas is that like an alien piloted a craft of dimensions and power far beyond what we could achieve at that time and place. The pilots then lost control of the vessel and came tearing through the atmosphere at a rate of knots, their craft lighting up the night sky for thousands of miles. The idea was bolstered somewhat by claims that some debris had been found in the area, some fragments of metal that had no business being there and no other explanation for their source. A group was then sent in in the late 1920s to investigate the area and search for this strange metal scattered around the impact zone, assisted by the Avinki tribe. Others stated that these were parts of like alien technology that obviously that brought the creatures here. The lack of an impact crater never seemed to deter proponents of this theory. They argued that the craft may have disintegrated entirely upon entry. A more rational and possible source for the various metal fragments was proposed over the intervening decades. The barren wastelands of Siberia, and particularly the region where the event happened, became a relatively popular graveyard for a different and much more conventional form of air travel, rockets. The Soviet Union was the second major player in the big space race of the late century eventually losing, being beaten out by the Americans in the race to the moon. That's right. Everybody was like, oh, but the Soviets were in space first. It doesn't matter. We planted the flag on the moon first. It's ours. Get over it. Prior to that, however, the USSR arguably achieved a lot more success. They got, again, the first man to space, Yuri Gurgan, and beat the US in a number of feats, but we, ultimately, we beat them. Like, I, I hate it for them. Like, it is what it is, man. You know, don't hate the player, hate the game, scoreboard, whatever you gotta call it. We won. And that's just not my pro-Americanism talking, it's just reality. But great aerospace achievements require many, many rockets. And part of the launch process involved jettisoning, that's a very strange word, the boosters, and where better to get rid of them than over a largely uninhabited area. This is where aerospace enthusiasts and UFOologists, that's right, UFOologists, that actually exists, disagree, which, who are you gonna believe? To some, it makes sense that over the decades, many metal fragments would logically and probably just by like looking at flight logs, become scattered over these barren areas. Fragments that point more to man's desire to get to space rather than space desire to get to us. One of the most plausible and potentially rational explanations has been offered years after the fact, and the answer, surprisingly enough, did actually come from the sky after all. It's possible that the devastation caused that day came from outer space, something on a collision course with Earth. One of the proportions that are not only hard to imagine but hard to believe is it would have hurtled towards Earth at speeds around 50 thousand kilometers per hour, reaching incredible temperatures as it approached the Earth and then entered the atmosphere. This would have caused it to basically deteriorate. The extreme forces on a massive hunk of rock combined with the heat generated would have caused it to fragment, gradually at first but eventually exploding into multiple smaller fragments each of them, a flaming mass of devastation, rain from above. Described by scientists as a meteor airburst exploding over the ground over Tunguska, causing the enormous explosion, the damage, the light, the detections on seismic monitoring equipment, everything. For some brief context, they are known as meteoroids when they are still traveling through space, but meteors when they enter the atmosphere, and meteorites because they have the right stuff to hit the ground. Comets, on the other hand, are primarily made of ice and dust and tend to disintegrate easier when exposed to the extreme temperatures entering Earth's atmosphere. And in a similar yet possible theory, a comet was the source of the event. Given that later assessments would put the location of the explosion as high as 10 kilometers in the air, this could be a contender as it does share many core aspects with 
with the more accepted airburst idea. While the most accepted account was a meteor exploding above the ground, for record keeping purposes, this is still classed as an impact event, essentially putting it in the same category as any object that have physically collided with Earth and left craters and other scars in their wake. This is indeed the explanation that holds the most water. Then we are left with what must be the largest such event on record. While there are signs and indications around the world, both born on the surface of Earth and the history of nature that shows much more significant impacts that have occurred in the distant past, this one was still pretty significant. So that's where we leave the Tunguska event. The main question left to pose is whether the modern scientific explanations marry up with the physical reality of what happened over that barren Siberian landscape more than 100 years ago. When we look back through history, there are many incidents where the objects from space have entered our atmosphere and either burned up spectacularly in the sky or impacted with little to no effect on the people or wildlife immediately around them. Equally, there is evidence of major impacts that have clearly affected the course of the world. After all, there are multiple craters around the world that seem to bear the scar that marks uh, Earth's surface, showing that this was a pretty bad impact. One of the most popular theories regarding what caused the mass extinction events that took many of the dinosaurs to extinction based on this very idea is that an asteroid or meteor of truly enormous proportions hit the Earth, and aside from like the devastation that it left behind locally, this kicked up enough dust and debris to limit sunlight for an extended period of time. The resulting upset to the ecosystem led to the ultimate demise of a myriad of creatures. Regardless of what caused it, whether it was alien intervention, probably not, a meteor airburst, probably, or something else, not likely, there is one question that lingers in the back of most people's mind when it comes to an event like this. How likely could we experience another Tunguska event, either in our lifetimes or sometime in the future? The reality is, is that no one can really be certain. Estimates of a similar event occurring can range really from once a century all the way up to even a million years. What remains is the reality that had the Tunguska event or whatever had happened somewhere like populous, then the results would have been even more disastrous. While there are at least three unconfirmed deaths, we look to the area that the blast had covered and the damage that it caused, and it's hard to picture how bad it could have really been unless it happened over California. No, no <laughs> I'm just playing California. Anyways, if we imagine it landing somewhere more populous even slightly, then the death toll could have run up into the hundreds and well beyond. So even if we all can't agree on what the actual Tunguska event was, natural, unnatural, alien, or human, at least we can all agree that this is something that we really don't want to happen again, which is why we need to develop an asteroid defense system so that we don't just get a bug planet hurling asteroids at us. But anyhow, I want to thank you guys for watching. If you enjoyed, then leave a like would be fantastic of you. And subscribing is a great way to stay up to date on when I post as we are almost at 200,000 subs. Well, I don't know. Maybe maybe we already passed it by now. I'm not sure. It is the future after all. I'll drop my Twitter, Discord, Patreon, uh, channel links, all that good stuff in the description, as well as my merch links if you want to support the channel. But speaking of patrons, I'd like to thank mine real quick. At the literal Wendigo tier, we have Grayson West and Trash Panda in a trench coat. Thank you, guys. Then to the eyewitness to the event tier, we have Beaver Malaga and Wet Skeleton. At the first-hand accounts, we have Cody Cherry Drake, Yeeps. And at the second-hand accounts, we have Cannon Johnson, Fred Rush, and Troy. And the rest of my patrons, I appreciate y'all's support as well. It goes a long way towards helping out everything. And is, like I said, it's greatly appreciated. So that's going to do it for me. I hope everyone enjoyed. And I'll see y'all in the next one.